Welcome to our first ever GCN Facebook Live service. I'm hoping it's our last, but we'll see. In the meantime, we're gonna err on the side of caution and continue to cooperate with uh, all the efforts to minimize the spread of this coronavirus. And so we'll review that week by week. We'll miss being together in this place today, but uh, glad so many of you are tuning in and we hope this online connection will be encouraging to everyone today. We've got a few folks in the sanctuary with me, and I'll acknowledge them every once in a while, but uh, for the most part, I'm going to focus on you. I've got my St. Patrick's Day green on. I'm guessing a few of you are still in your pajamas, but that's a good thing. Um, I've been calling on some of our senior adults this weekend and other folks that are especially at risk, and... Uh, that's been good. I hope we'll all do that. I heard back from Carol Record, one of our beautiful senior adult ladies, and uh, also been dealing with her own medical conditions the last several years. Had to leave a message for her. She sent me an email back that I've gotten her permission to read. I thought it was encouraging in response to the question, how are you doing? Speaking for her and her sister, Sherry, this is what she wrote. We are both actually rejoicing that we can be at peace during this chaotic time. How wonderful to know that our Lord is in control. And if you know me, I need to word, use, add the word ultimately. In control and working all things together for his good purpose. So while, quote, normal has been drastically altered in the worldly sense, normal in our spiritual world remains the same and unmovable. Praising him more every day. What an amazing and wonderful God we know, love, and serve. I was reminded of a song that's been running through my head a lot recently. I think it's called, I Go to the Rock. When all around me is sinking sand, on Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. Guess there are always times that try our souls, and as a result, lots of songs that talk about it from generation to generation. Praying that all of this chaos will bring many lost and hurting souls to the realization that God is and that God is good, will bring them out of their darkness into the light of the world, into a whole new, quote, normal. Carol Record, I thought that was a good word. Challenges can actually be uh, opportunities. Wondering what we're going to do with the time we might have invested watching that NCAA tournament or flying out to that conference, or going to those classes. I'd encourage us all to reinvest that time. Get outside. Made a world of difference for me yesterday when I did that. Take a walk. Walk and pray. Yeah, let's pray more. Our president has called on the entire nation today in a national day of prayer to seek God's face. Let's read a book. Let's read God's book. Let's be in touch with those folks that we never can seem to make time to be in touch with. 
Let's write a letter. Let's pick up the phone. Let's look for ways to uh, help someone. Won't be the last time you'll hear that from us this morning. And through it all, let's be a calming, confident witness to our faith and trust in God in these challenging days. Amen. So grab your Bible. Brian's going to come in just a moment and read from God's word. And then as he leads us in prayer from this sanctuary, you all pray with him in those uh, households of faith you're in right now. God bless you and God bless this time we have together. Our scripture for this morning is from Psalm 46. Um, God's word is not just informational, it's transformational. And I love that this psalm, most likely written by David, some 2,500 to 3,000 years ago, is just as relevant and timely now as it was then. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, <laughs> kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That's verse seven, I'm gonna read it again. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to spend these next couple of moments doing what might be the most important thing for us as a church scattered yet gathered this morning. We're going to pray together. And I do mean together. I'm going to lead us in prayer. But it's my prayer that you would join me and imagine, maybe even envision that brothers and sisters around the world joining together right now in prayer to God. That's big stuff. Let's pray together. God, we proclaim what we know is true. You are with us. You are good. We can trust you. And we admit that sometimes we can have a tendency to fear or we could have a tendency to want to preserve our way of life. But you always ask us to trust you. In fact, throughout history and in scripture, it seems like trusting you is the whole point of what you're trying to do in our life. God, I pray that over these next few moments of worship, we would be reformed. May our worship reorient our lives around you, the one who gave up his life. God, we pray that you would be with those who are hurting, those who are frustrated, those who are uncertain about maybe the financial ramifications or the health ramifications those who already have other worries going on, and this maybe adds to it, those who are more susceptible maybe to some anxiety, those who are sick right now, those who are struggling. God, we pray that you would be near. And we pray with confidence, knowing that you are near. You, God, you tend to enter right into pain and tragedy and anxiety and pandemics. <laughs> You entered right into death itself and you overcame it. 
So yes, we know that you are very near and we pray right now for you to enter in to this space. And we remember, God, that you have always been above time. You've always been transcended geographic restrictions. So now we invite you into this space and it's beautiful because what we're saying is come into this home. <laughs> come into this place where we're gathered right now and it may feel like we're alone, but we know that we're connected. God, we invite you in by your spirit. We know that you come. Your church has gathered and that's always beautiful. And so we worship you this morning, God. Amen. Amen. Mike's going to come and lead us in a song of worship. Morning, GCN, and uh, shout out to Carol Record. Hope you're uh, listening in, Carol. This is a um, song on Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. to do a, another song in the same context. You know, this is a Lenten season for those of you uh, observing that, a period of time where Christ was out in the wilderness being tempted and we're off to give up things. This week it seems awful easy to maybe give us some of those things or maybe it's not so easy to give us some things that we're used to having all the time. But uh, use this time to listen to the words of, of this song um, and uh, join in from home. You'll know the words uh, on the chorus for sure. Sinners such as I 
song blesses you as it uh, blesses me. I'd like to uh, offer just a, a short prayer here before uh, Pastor Ben comes back to the pulpit to give us the message today. Dear Father God, we come to you this morning with praise and thanksgiving, Lord. We know uh, who you are and what you've done for us, Lord. We're so thankful uh, to have you on our side. You give us strength, Lord. We ask for your grace and mercy today in this time of anxiety for, uh, for many of us, Lord, and ask that you um, just give us that uh, grace and that uplifting that we need, Lord, to recognize who you are, uh, what you've done, Lord, and uh, give us encouragement in this time. Uh, please bless Ben as he brings us the message and as he uh, gives us the truth of your word, Lord, in all these things we pray. Amen. Thanks, Mike. I've been singing those hymns for a long time, a few of the rest of you have as well. The truth is timeless, amen? Well, lots happened since we were all together in this place uh, last Sunday, eh? I thought I'd be changing this message for the occasion, planned this message a couple of months ago, but I'm thinking it's right on for today. It's a message I'm titling, Reach Out and Touch Someone. So trivia question for you, get ready. You've got five seconds to answer out loud wherever you are. What business, what company was that one line a jingle for? You'd have to go back to the 80s to get that answer. Reach out and touch someone. Four, three, two, one, AT&T. And not a bad tagline for the ministry of Jesus either. Grab your Bibles at home and let's come back to the gospel of Luke. Uh, folks, I want to know Christ. I want to know Jesus better. And not just uh, information about him. I want to know him experientially and intimately. I want to share life with him and I want to live life for him. And I hope, I pray that this Lenten season is an opportunity for, uh, for us to get to know Christ better. There's quite a bit I'd like to circle back to from last week's uh, message, but let me sum up our look at the Savior from last Sunday this way. 
Jesus spoke truth. He still does. He is the truth. And sometimes the truth is hard to hear. And not everyone loves those who speak truth. Not everyone loves Jesus. Jesus sums it up this way in John chapter 3 in that conversation that he had with Nicodemus that night. This is the verdict, Jesus said. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have and what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Now, Jesus speaks some truth that sometimes is hard to hear. He had some pretty forthright words for those of us who are rich, for would-be followers. He's asked us to love our enemies. He's called people out for being hypocrites and having too little faith. But Jesus always speaks truth in love. In fact, it's why he speaks truth, even and maybe especially the truth that's hard to hear. Sometimes the truth is necessary, a diagnosis so that there can be treatment and healing. Jesus loves us deeply. In that same third chapter of John, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, Jesus said, but to save the world through him. So we're going to focus on the love side of that truth in love equation today and lift up an example of the compassion of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. So if you have those Bibles or you have that app open, turn to Luke chapter 5. We'll begin at verse 12. The Good Doctor's Gospel, Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I'm willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news spread about him all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. That is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What does this passage tell us about Jesus? I've come up with at least five things. The first thing is something about Jesus we've noted a few times in recent years that many of Jesus' opportunities came along the way, in route, passing through a town, on his way to a planned uh, village uh, visit or uh, dinner party. And I believe the same will be true for all of us as well. It will often be on the way in unplanned ways that we'll have opportunities to be Christ to others. It may be on the way to the grocery store this week, not to hoard TP, by the way. And by the way, if you have any extra baby aspirin, call the Eitmillers from our church. They could use some. I'm always amazed at the opportunities, I tell you that once in a while, that we have when we just are decent human beings, when we engage people, when we ask how they're doing, and uh, genuinely want to know. In my sabbatical report last week, it was inserted in the bulletin. I said that uh, likely you'd be hearing a few stories from that time away about uh, a rainbow, a Panera bread, and an oil change. And it seems to me like the uh, oil change story would be a good illustration for this passage. While I was in uh, Columbus with my oldest daughter, Rebecca, I uh, realized that I was about 2,000 miles overdue for an oil change on my truck. So I went to a local outfit, a Valvoline station, and got my oil change. They uh, 
kind of do like Jiffy Lube and you get in line and a guy comes out and he asks you for your mileage and asks you a few other questions. The guy that came out uh, that day, uh, his name was Ozzy. And he saw a baseball that I keep on the uh, dashboard of my truck. Uh, when I was growing up, I had this dream of playing left field for the Cincinnati Reds. Obviously, that didn't pan out. God called me to do something uh, different or else I'd be playing left field for the Cincinnati Reds. But anyway, I keep a baseball on my dashboard with a question. Uh, God, what dreams do you have for us? And it's a reminder to me that God has those dreams for us. And it's a reminder to stay on my purpose. So anyway, he saw that baseball, wondered if it was an autograph ball from somebody uh, famous. And I explained the story to him and it became a conversation about uh, God and church. And I had the opportunity to encourage Ozzy, who was a, what was his word, private practitioner, to perhaps circle back to a church and find a good one and make it better because he was there. But those are the opportunities that we have along the way if we'll just have eyes to see them. Our lives, our rhythms, and routines are going to be changing for a while, and it may very well create some new and different opportunities to touch someone's life along the way. Keep your eyes open for those opportunities. See the people you're passing along the way. Slow down and ask God to lead you to the folks who may need him. That's exactly what Jesus did. The second thing about Jesus and the main thing this passage tells us about is that Jesus loves people, all people, and he has compassion on them. And as you read the Gospels, you've got to believe that Jesus has a special place in his heart for those who are especially needy, for those whom perhaps others have discarded or disgraced. Here's where we get the title of the message. Jesus literally reached out and touched someone that society considered untouchable. Can you imagine what that moment, that touch meant to that man. I think we're all uh, feeling for those who are stuck on cruise ships or uh, in isolation uh, for a time. Um, my son-in-law, Jared, he may be watching. Shout out to you, Jared. Just got back from a 10-day mission trip to Paris, France. And while there apparently came in contact with someone who came in contact with someone who had been diagnosed with the coronavirus. So upon his landing in Kansas City, he was escorted to uh, uh, isolate for uh, 14 days. Uh, Jared, two days down, 12 to go. I'm guessing he's looking forward to a hug from uh, his wife, our daughter, Abby, and some contact with some other folks as well. This man in the story in Luke chapter five, uh, being a leper, was required to shout out unclean, unclean, so that everyone who might have been around him as he came into town, if he was even allowed to do that, could keep their distance. He had literally been shut off from any human contact, perhaps for years, perhaps his entire life. Can you imagine what that moment, that touch from Jesus meant to him? I was really challenged by this uh, passage this week and the example of Jesus given our current situation. Now, I'm not recommending that we uh, throw caution to the wind. We need to be safe. We need to be taking the precautions that are being encouraged on us. But unless we're in those vulnerable categories, let's not so isolate and so insulate ourselves from others that we aren't available to help someone. We may have uh, gloves on, but this is no time to stop reaching out and touching people. Challenging times are great opportunities. Always have been. I thought about a book by John Ortberg that I've referenced a number of times before over the years, uh, Who Is This Man? One of my favorites from him. He notes uh, in history some examples of folks that did exactly that in Jesus' name. He mentioned a church father named Basil who had an idea for... Uh, developing a place for lepers to come who could be cared for. His brother Gregory of Nicaea, also a uh, church father, 
preached a sermon to raise money for that uh, home for lepers. And reading from uh, John Ortberg's chapter here, he said that was the beginning of what would come to be known as hospitals. The Council of Nyssa, the same council that affirmed the Nicene Creed, decreed that wherever a cathedral existed, there must be a hospice, a place of caring for the sick and poor. That's why uh, many hospitals today have names such as Good Samaritan or Good Shepherd or St. Anthony or Holy Cross. They were the world's first voluntary charitable institutions. Another follower of Jesus named Jean Henry Dunant couldn't stand the sound of soldiers crying out on a battlefield after they had been wounded. So the Swiss philanthropist said he would devote his life to helping them in Jesus' name. That started an organization in the 1960s that became known as the Red Cross. Every time you see the Red Cross, you are seeing a thumbprint of Jesus. Another follower of Jesus became known as Father Damien, a Belgian priest. He worked in Hawaii in the 19th century and created a place where lepers could be loved and cared for. He used to tell them every week, God loves you lepers. And then one week he got up and he said, God loves us lepers. He died from leprosy. Centuries ago, the church father Tertullian said, it is our care of the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of our opponents. Compassion became the brand of this new religious movement. May it be so for us as well, amen? You may not uh, hug a leper today. You may not literally touch someone at all, but there's a lot of ways to touch a life, a note, a kind word, a good deed, an act of service, a gift. But if we're going to make a difference in this world in Jesus' name, if we're going to love the way Jesus loved, we're going to have to get involved. We're going to have to get our hands dirty. We're going to have to roll up our sleeves. We're going to have to wade in like Jesus did. You won't touch lives if you don't. Friends, this passage and so many others gives evidence of the love of God fleshed out, fleshed out in the sun and expressed in tangible ways. That was Jesus every single day. I pray it's us as well. The Gospels say the people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he taught as one who had authority. I'm sure that had something to do with Jesus' confidence in the Father, had something to do with the humble, humble confidence with which he spoke, with the clarity with which he taught. But I can't help but think that his healing miracles, that Jesus' compassion, and the tangible ways in which he loved and lived out the truth he taught contributed significantly to people's amazement. Someone once said, people won't care about how, you, how much you know until they know how much you care. I believe that's true. This passage tells us at least three other things about Jesus. He wasn't into being popular. Look at the first part of that 14th verse. Then Jesus ordered the man he had just healed don't tell anyone. That may not have been the uh, only or even primary reason Jesus encouraged the man not to spread the word, but it certainly had something to do with it. He wasn't into popularity. Jesus wasn't anti-religion or anti-religious people. We hit that last Sunday a bit. Look at the last half of that same 14th verse. To the man, he said, go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Jesus opposed the proud, religious or otherwise. He confronted the religious, especially religious leaders who kept all the rules, but who had little love for God or others, who in fact insulated themselves from others and alienated others from God. But Jesus didn't confront them because they were religious. He confronted them because their religion had become an end in itself rather than a means to a restored relationship with God and others. And finally, Jesus got alone to pray often. Verse 16, 
Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and pray. Why? Why did Jesus do that and, and why should we? Perhaps Jesus recognized the potential corruption of popularity and power. It certainly has that effect. No doubt Jesus sought the guidance and help of the Father and so he slipped away to pray. Time alone with God in prayer helps us to retain the perspective God wants us to have. It keeps us on the way and in the game. But in light of this passage and message today, I'm reminded of the uh, need we have of replenishment, especially for those of us that are giving and serving, and trying to be there for others, like Jesus was and is. We need to be with the Father. Let him pour out his love into our hearts. We need to uh, be reminded of his promises and the truth of his word and be encouraged in his presence. No doubt Jesus needed that too. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. If you had been here with us today, I had a picture uh, that a colleague of mine, Paul McPherson, posted on his Facebook page a few months ago of his uh, dad and his favorite place at a park at a picnic bench. And that picture showed uh, Neil McPherson out in Kansas City, uh, First Church of the Nazarene, uh, praying, head bowed, and eyes closed, and hands folded, uh, enjoying time with the Father, and no doubt praying for his family, his friends, and his church. Beautiful picture. If Jesus, Jesus often prayed, so should we. We need to pray because we need God. Indeed, it's a privilege to pray. In the spirit of uh, the hymns we're singing today, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. We're going to pray once more in just a few minutes, but before we do, I want to circle back to the, uh, the difference Jesus makes in our lives. Back to his compassion, to the way he touches us. And it's not just a physical healing that results from that touch. And I'm not sure that that's our greatest need even in these uh, COVID-19 days. Jesus' touch results in lots of healing of various sorts and literally changes our life. My grandpa was uh, known for uh, recitations. He would memorize well-known poems and uh, passages of scripture and stories. And one of my favorites that my grandpa used to uh, recite was a poem about an old violin that an auctioner was trying to uh, unload called The Touch of the Master's Hand. And I thought about that reading and wanted to share it with you uh, here this morning. The Touch of the Master's Hand. It was battered and scarred and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to wait waste much time on the old violin, but held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two. Two dollars, and who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. But no, from the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings, he played a melody, pure and sweet, as sweet as caroling angels sing. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once. 3,000 twice and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We do not quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. To many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin, his auction cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. 
a mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He is going once and going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes. And the foolish crowd can't quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Praise be to his name. My friends, we were that old violin. We were that leper, a desperate person in need of the mercy of God. Perhaps most all of us listening today have known the touch of Jesus. If you haven't, you can. He's there with you, knocking at the door of your heart. Ask him in. If you have, experience Jesus' touch. Jesus asks you to do what he's done for you. Reach out and touch someone today. Maybe so. Father, I pray that we would all fall at your feet. Come before the throne of grace today where there is mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. We need you, Father, and are encouraged and rejoice in the reality of your love for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter where we've been, what our story is, what we've come out of, who we are, what we've done. God, your love is never ending and unfailing and unconditional. And God, I pray that everyone here in this sanctuary and in the sound of my voice today would come to you and receive that love and mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And Father, I pray for your church scattered uh, even more so today than usual, that every one of us would be Christ's hands and feet, his eyes and ears, and have his heart and his love for the folks that uh, we come across along the way and share life with day in and day out. Lord Jesus, help us to be like you. Help us to go where you would go if you were us, to do what you would do if you were us, and to be you in this world until you come again. I pray that with thanksgiving for all you've done and all the ways you've blessed us. I pray that today in Jesus' name. And all God's people, wherever they are today, said, Amen. Amen. God bless. Closing hymn today, we're going to sing a sweet hour of prayer. So join with me if you know the words. If not, just listen to the words and... Um, some good words in this song that talk about our anxious spirits, but uh, really the focus is a quiet time that Christ had. Um, and look to that until the time that we join him. Where?
petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace, all passed on him my head. everybody. Thanks for connecting on our webcast this morning. It doesn't uh, measure up to meeting face-to-face, -face, but given the circumstances, uh, it's great to see a community online, and thank you for doing that this morning. From my perspective, you look great today, and that includes you, Mike Berg, so thanks again for tuning in. Our church is going to be contacting and reaching out to some people and places that we have relationships with, three local schools, two nursing homes, and one women's shelter. And we're going to be asking what, they're, what they are in need of during this time. And if you are willing and able to be a part of responding to those needs, whatever they may be, would you mind dropping a, a line to the church office, either by email or a call this week? And uh, we'll get the information out to you as we receive it. As far as we know, our sanctuary renovation plan is still on schedule to begin at the end of March. And you'll be receiving a letter in the mail this week, so check your mail at home that has more information about our upcoming renovation plan. To keep current in your giving to GCN, you can do that three ways during this time, by writing a check and putting it in the mail, by logging on to the CCB database, or you could also just uh, use your phone and text to give. And uh, you can do that electronically, and it's very simple to do. I would refer you to our Monday and Friday All Church emails that has information about the text to give. If you're not receiving those All Church emails every week, uh, contact the church office uh, this coming week, either with a phone call or an email, and we'll get you added to that list. And also, we'll be communicating our service plans here at GCN and uh, how our schedule is going to be affected by the coronavirus. Uh, in the upcoming days. So use our website and uh, check your emails and we'll be communicating with you that way. Before Brian comes to close us, just one other recommendation. It's good to be informed during these times, but we would encourage you also to avoid overload of information and uh, really seek balance in your life so that uh, you can keep things in perspective. Thanks again, have a great afternoon and uh, have a good week ahead too. We want to say thanks again for tuning in and joining us in this Facebook live streaming uh, version of our service. And this is typically the part of the worship service where we send you out and we ask you to go out and love and serve others. But you, uh, we've made that a little simpler today because you're already scattered. And so you don't need to be sent out, but we do, uh, we do want to be a part of the same task, which is loving the world the way Jesus loves the world. And so this is the blessing. This is the benediction for today as we go, um, as we go about our day and all that we do. It's a paraphrase from uh, the prayer of St. Patrick in the midst of all this. Did you know St. Patrick's Day is coming up in a couple of days? This is a paraphrase from the prayer of St. Patrick. It's actually the lyrics to one of my favorite songs right now. Here's the words. May the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. 
May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your grieving and rejoicing. He is for you. Jesus is for you. So today, as we go about our day, show the world what Jesus' love and grace and peace looks like. Go in his perfect love. You are loved this morning.